Yeah, I'm a proud board member of the foundation as of the past year, so books and libraries mean something very deep and important. Um, so glad to be a part of that. Um, just a little bit about Mahogany Books, if you're not aware. Let me see by a show of hands who is not familiar with Mahogany Books. Okay, I see six of you. I'm just joking, that was my ego talking, just joking. Uh, but a lot of you, looks like, um, are familiar, and that's a, a gift to us. Um, but my husband, Derek, and I, he's out. Oh, he's right here. This, I was going to say sexy, but there's kids. This gentleman there. Um, we actually have been, been in business for 16 years and married for 21. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, and in 2007, we created Mahogany Books at that time. We were in our one-bedroom apartment in Alexandria, Virginia. And the impetus, we just, impetus was we just wanted to make black books accessible, no matter where you lived. I grew up in Tulsa in Black Wall Street, um, miles from it, and I never knew Black Wall Street was there by my home because it was never taught in my schools and never taught in my books. And if I had known about the innovators and trailblazers and thought leaders that were blocks from my home, how much taller, how much more confident I would have been, but I did, I did not know. So for us, creating Mahogany Books, we didn't want that to be for anybody else. The history, the books, the information that's there, we feel like it's important that everybody have access to those things, right? And so that's how we created Mahogany Books. Fast forward to 17 years later, we're here at National Harbor. We have a store. Thank you. National Harbor, our first store was in D.C. and Anacostia in Southeast, where they have not had a bookstore in over 20 years. Yes, important. They need books, too. Um, and then recently, in September, we have a footprint in, in, Ray, uh, in National Airport, and we're very excited about that. So, yes, thank you all for just coming out, for showing up for books, not just for us, but for the libraries and for the authors, and for the importance that these conversations create. These sacred spaces is what I call them, for us to hear, for us to learn, for us to be invited to think outside of ourselves. That's what books do, that's what libraries do, and that's what um, these type of author conversations create. So let's get into it. <laughs> um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things before we get started. Make sure you mute your phones. I'm going to make sure I mute mine. I think I did over there. Um, also. Um, if you uh, want to take photos, just make sure your flash is off as well. Um, and then also, you should have note cards. If you want to ask a question at the end, we're going to collect your note cards. So either myself, Chanel's right here, this amazing woman, David Quick, who was just sp speaking. Well, you can pass, oh, behind us. You can pass your note cards to one of us. And so at the end, we'll kind of go through them and maybe pull two or three that the authors can um, respond to. Um, also, your books have been signed already. Dr. Kendi, I mean, I'm not even gonna tell you how fast he signed, but he signed every last one of these books that came in. And so they already are signed. What we will do at the end is we'll have a photo line. So if you do want to have a photo taken, just make sure you hand me your cell phone and I'll make sure we get you in and get the, the photos taken for you, okay? Let me hear you snap if that makes sense. Thank you, audience. <clears throat> so anyway, let's get into it. Enjoy this conversation um, with, first of all, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Tony Keith Jr., also affectionately, affectionately known here and across the world as Ed MC. And just a slight plug, we're hosting uh, Dr. Tony Keith at our store for his book launch here on February 6th. Uh, Dr. Tony Keith, I just like saying doctor, so please come on up. Dr. Tony Keith is a black American gay poet, spoken word artist, and hip hop educational leader from Washington, D.C. He is author of the YA memoir, In Verse, How the Boogeyman Became a Poet. Tony's writings have appeared in the International Journal of Critical Media Literacy, the Journal of Black Masculinity, and many others. A multi-year fellow of the DC Commission on Arts and Humanities with a PhD in education from George Mason, Tony is the CEO of Ed MC Academy and lives with his husband, Harry Christian III, in his hometown of DC. You can visit Dr. Tony Keith at TonyKeithJr.com. Please welcome our moderator for tonight, the Ed MC. Hey! Next up is our featured author of the evening, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. Let's give it up for that, first of all. Yes, yes, yes. Um, just a little, just a little side note. We, at, my husband and I, actually met Dr. Kendi. I guess it was back in two, 2019 before we, he became Dr. I mean, just next level Dr. Kendi. Um, but he had created the first ever, ever anti-racist festival at that time, and so. 
for a, a bookstore like ours to be affiliated with something like that was just unheard of. So we were just grateful for that opportunity in that moment. Um, so to fast forward to now and have many opportunities to connect with him and to host him, I just consider him as a, as a friend. And so it's just a great moment to have you here tonight. So let's get into about Mr. Dr. Kendi. Kendi is a National Book Award winning and number one New York Times bestselling author. His books include Anti-Racist Baby, Good Night Racism, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and How to Raise an Anti-Racist. Dr. Kendi is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor in the Humanities at Boston University and the director of the BU Center for Anti-Racist Research. In 2020, Time Magazine named Dr. Kendi one of the 100 most influential people in the world, not just DC, not Southeast, but in the world, right? He has also been awarded a 2021 MacArthur Fellowship. And tonight we are here for, to learn about, to hear about Barra Coon and this phenomenal story that so many people in history have not heard about. Mm -hmm. And to have this adaptation for young adults, um, young readers is something so very powerful to me. So let's please give it up for Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. Hey. Hello, hello, ah, ooh, I sound great. Good evening, everybody, how you doing, y'all right? Fantastic, fantastic. A uh, couple of just quick things, I always just like to say thank yous again. Thank you, Mahogany Books, thank you, DC Public Libraries, um, and certainly thank you, Dr. Kenny, for being here. Um, we're gonna just get right to it. Uh, can you just give us the, sh the three minute thing? What's the, what is Barracoon, what is it about? Tell us that part, what's Barracoon? Start there. Well, first, let me just thank everyone for, for coming out. This evening, of course, I want to thank Mahogany Books, and I want to congratulate you on your new book. Thank you very much. Memoir and verse for that's about to come out. It, it's it's this Barracoon is is the life story of of Kajo Lewis, told to the legendary Zora Neale Hurston. And Kajo Lewis, at the time when he told this story to to Zora, he was the last known survivor of the transatlantic human trade from, from Africa to the United States. But what's fascinating to me about his story is that it's a story that really begins in Africa and to a certain extent ends in Africa town. Uh, in, it, sure, I um, am quite soft-spoken <laughs> if you don't know. It's, it's a story that starts in Africa uh, and, and really ends in Africa town in Africa town in which he faced uh, Jim Crow. And so it's really a story of African freedom to enslavement, to emancipation, to a second slavery in Jim Crow. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I had a chance to uh, read the advanced copy of this book, right? And this is important because I'm someone who did not grow up reading Zora Neale Hurston. Right, and so I knew nothing of this story, was not even aware sort of this, thing. well, I know as an adult, right? But this was not something that was offered to me as a young person. And so I remember as I was reading this as an adult, the way it was filling in, I think, some gaps about what I know about myself as a black person and the descendant of enslaved people. And so I'm wondering for you, for, uh, well, not for you, but like for the audience, for those of us who don't know much about Zora Neale Hurston or sort of the books, like why is something like what she wrote so important now for, for young readers? Like why Zora Neale, what's the history behind that? Well, I think in terms of why it's important for young readers, we're, we're, we're living in a time in which uh, young readers are being prevented from learning right. about slavery. We're, we're, we're living in a time in which books on racism uh, are being banned. We're, we're living in a time when uh, books that express the culture and the idioms and the languages of, you know, of, of, you know, of regular folks uh, are being looked down upon. And, but I think in the case of, of Zora Neale Hurston, this book in particular demonstrates that she wasn't just a legendary novelist. Yeah. She wasn't just a, le a legendary folklorist. Mm -hmm. She was also a legendary anthropologist. Yes. And, and so for her, the preservation of this story, particularly in the voice yes. Of, of, of Kudrow Lewis is really a demonstration of, of her skill as, as an anthropologist. And it was her first major uh, anthropological trip, 
which sort of goes to show uh, the type of anthrop <laughs> anthropologist she ultimately became. Yeah. And the kind of questions that she was asking, right? I, I, I remember, again, reading this book, there's so much about this book. Kod Kodo's voice is written in African-American vernacular English or black language, and as a black man, I was so excited to just read that language, because I don't know, for me, it, was, it centered something about, because I had a question before about, you know, if enslaved Africans already had language, right, before they were dragged around the world, like, how in the world did they learn American Standard English without giving like a culturally relevant method of, like how, did, what language did they create? And I think about the dis, dat, day, erry, by, mother, father, those of us in DC who speak like that, like where that comes from, and then to read that language coming from an African man in a book was very powerful. Um, can you talk to us a bit about language and including AAVE? Because this is Kojo's, Kujo's, this is his, it's his words as they were spoken, right? So in many ways to me, language uh, is, is the sound of culture. And, and so it was incredibly important for, for Zara New Hurston to not only uh, collect and write about his story, but how he told his story. And I, I think it's important for us to understand language in the way linguists understand language, which is uh, they essentially define language as communication with rules. <laughs> so if we understand it at that basic level, there are a number of different languages. <laughs> there are even a number of different uh, languages within the English tree uh, that all should be respected and protected. And, and indeed, African people who were enslaved in the Americas and more or less compelled and forced uh, to speak uh, English or, or French uh, or Dutch or Portuguese or, or Spanish typically created new languages yes. that, that sort of blended the old with the new, just as English is a, comes from Germanic and Latin languages. Absolutely. <laughs> right, so, so you know, I, I think that African people were creating new languages too, and I think those languages should be respected yeah. and heard. Yeah. Uh, because in many ways, in certain types of ways, they're endangered. Yeah, ooh, endangered. I, uh, who I was gonna go somewhere with that, but I just, what I appreciate about that, uh, Dr. Kenny, is the affirmation Right, especially for young readers who speak like that, who write like that, who whose voices in their heads sound like that. I know black kids who talk like Kujo in this book, right? And so can you talk to us about adapting this story for younger readers, right? We had this joke in the not really a joke in the green room. We're both PhD people, we got all this academic stuff, but to write for a young adult audience requires some sort of adaptation, translation, can you talk to us about that process? How did you go from what Zora Neale Hurston put together into this? So it was really hard. Uh, uh, and, and I was hoping you weren't gonna say it was easy. I mean. Nah, not in, I, I, think, I think the way in which I was able to get into, I think both the, the sort of head and spiritual space to, to adapt this book is I, I I kept thinking about, and you'll, you'll read, for those of you who haven't read Barracoon, you'll, you'll read about uh, Kajo Lewis's relationship with his great-granddaughters. Yeah. And so during the book, Zora narrates him like giving them peaches, right? You know, or him looking at them play in the yard affectionately. And, and, and that became important to me because I started to think how would Kajo Lewis have told his story, not to Zora Neale Hurston, but to his granddaughter, his great-granddaughters. And, and, and so I tried to sort of think about it in that way. So how would he have told these painful moments of his story to his great-granddaughter that yeah. he loved, right? That he, of course, didn't want to feel that pain, but still wanted to understand what happened to him. And, and, and I think that's what, what allowed me to, to start to think about, uh, and I think put me in the conceptual space to, to, to adapt this, but I would also add, the more that I thought about that, the more I thought about this grandfather telling his life story to his great-grandchild, I thought about the fact that I actually didn't grow up with grandfathers. So my father's father, uh, he never knew his, his father. My mother's father died a few months before I was born from cancer. 
So I didn't grow up with any grandfathers. And, and so in, in a way, the more that I adapted the book, the more that I almost sat in that same seat with his great granddaughters, uh, in which it, it became an experience for me in which Kajo wasn't just speaking to mm. his, his great granddaughters uh, as children, he was speaking to me as a child. So I started to think, oh, how would my great grandfather have told me his story, his life story, uh, particularly knowing my great-grandfather had to deal with the challenges of Jim Crow Georgia. Uh, and so that's how I was able to do it. And I think the reason why that was important to me and the reason why I wanted to think about how a great-grandfather or grandfather or grandmother would have told this life story to their, to their grandchild is because this is a difficult story. Yes. It's a painful story yes. at times, right? But grandparents still find ways to tell the painful aspects of their lives yes. to people that they love, to their children, to their grandchildren. And so there's a way to do that. Yeah. Um, I love that so much because it's making me think so much about the power of oral tradition and the ways in which that's always sort of been the thing that's held a lot of black folks together um, in terms of not being able to have access to always the right kind of literature or, you know, but just to be able to tell those stories. And so um, that's really amazing. And I was, you probably already answered, but I feel like maybe there's a little bit more there, but like, did you, did anything surprise you while writing this book? Did something like an aha moment hit you? I, I think, I, I think that when you adapt a book, you have to read it a number of times. There we go. <laughs> right, and, and you, in many ways, uh, and, and I think what, what really, I think, I don't want to say it surprised me in, in a sort of negative way, but a, in a sort of pleasantly surprised me, was the, I think there was somewhat of an artistry to the sort of Zora Neale Hurston interludes of narration. In other words, she could have easily written a book in which, at the beginning, Zara's approaching <laughs> Kajo's you know, cabin, and they, they talk, and then he starts telling the story, and then she comes in at the end. But throughout the book, there are times in which she interjects yes. her yes. dialogue with Kajo, or things that he's doing, or things that they're doing together. Yes. And, and the more that I read that, the more that I realized how genius that was yeah. in sort of holding the reader uh, and in sort of pacing the narrative. And, and so, of course, I wanted to, to ensure that that was, that that was retained yeah. um, and that that was sort of elevated. Yeah, I, I, I think yeah. particularly for young people, I thought that would be incredibly effective to making the book interesting. For sure. Um, even for me, while reading it, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, there's Zora, like Zora still with us in the book, right? Like Zora Neale Hurston's identity does not get lost in this story. I found myself like, oh, the, you know, there's this little side talk or, you know, and there's this relationship that she develops with Kudra in this book that I think is so fascinating. It's very much like an old man, you know, not wanting to be bothered sometimes, but loving to tell a lot of stories. Um, how did, in this case, because you mentioned keeping up the pace. Yes. All right, thank you. Y'all heard that. Shelter Service is available this evening. Um, keeping pace with the book. Um, this book is illustrations in there. How did those illustrations contribute to the story for you? Well, I mean, Jasmine Lee Johnson. I mean, I, you Shout out to Jasmine. Uh, yeah, this, I mean, her illustrations were just um, sort of, were just stunning. And... And the first illustration that she created that I saw, in which I knew that I was like, okay, I really need to work with her on this book, was this illustration that she, she, she says was inspired by this passage uh, she calls Smoke Pictures. Mm. And, and this was a passage when, uh, after Kajo Lewis is taken from his home and is being marched to the coast of Africa and uh, his captors uh, sort of create a fire 
and he's sort of staring into the fire and, and there's smoke coming from the fire, he sees his, his, his family members and he's sort of emotional. Yes. And, and so Zora sort of narrates that she left him there with his smoke pictures because it, clearly he was, he was in another place, uh, called Joe Lewis at that moment. And, and so Jasmine Lee Johnson recreates that scene you know, in, in the book, as well as a whole host of other scenes. And I just think, particularly for young people, for middle graders, that that's yeah. another way to not only capture them and, and, you know, and keep them reading, but also it allows their imagination you know, to flourish. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, obviously our, our kids are uh, fed a number of different images, but these are not images that they normally see. You know, the images and the scenes of, you know, the transatlantic uh, human trade. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, and I just have to say, the way that it's done in this book, I think, is so artful because uh, as a young reader, well, I'm an adult reader, obviously, but I can imagine as a young reader uh, trying to conceptualize what it was like to be someone who was captured from your home and dragged, you know, and, and I even think in the book, you know, Kujo mentioned this, you know, I didn't, something about not understanding what was going on, like why was I taken, why am I being forced to do this labor, this, I don't understand, what, what happened to me, right? Um, I'm just curious, you know, have you discussed this with younger readers and what are they saying, right? What about, maybe your children, I don't know, but like, how are young people responding to that story, do you know? So, I have a seven-year-old daughter, uh, Imani, uh, who, um, there's, who's probably my fiercest critic. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so I know you may see the, the number of different ways people say a whole bunch of things about, about me. It, it's nothing compared to what... <laughs> it's like what, true, what, raw, just... <laughs> uh, you know, what, what, what she would say. And, and, and I, you know, and so we, of course, had, you know, had conversations, uh, you know, about this book and about certain passages that I would read to her or that she would read. And, and what was just striking to me was, I mean, was that in many ways she became three or four years old, so three or four years old when they're asking all those whys. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was just relentless, yeah. you know, and, and, and constant. And, and to me, that was a good thing. Mm. Right, because to me, if a child, if a kid reads a text and they come across and they come out of it with question after that. question after that. question, not only does that mean we're not teaching them enough, but it also means that they're curious. Um, and I do think and I hope this will spark curiosity. And that's why for me, I, I'm considering it to be an introductory yeah. text, uh, particularly to, you know, to the transatlantic human trade. Uh, because I think it'll spark a tremendous number of questions from our kids. For, for sure, for sure. Uh, I, and it's, when you mentioned questions, I immediately thought about my nephew, who's grown now, he's like 20 something years old. But when he was about that questioning age, uh, there was a moment he, he had a, a pen, just like with a pen top on it, and he's flying this thing around, and he's like, Uncle Tony, what's this? I'm like, it's a pen. He goes, okay, and then he keeps flying the thing around. What's this? I'm like, it is a pen. And we do this repeatedly for like at least 10 times. And then I say, and he says, what is, it, what is this? And I say, what, you tell me what it is. What do you think it is? He says, it's an airplane. Right? And, and it dawned on me in that moment, like, I have to let this thing be an airplane for this kid. There's something about allowing kids to have an imagination and to have questions and to wonder. And sometimes adults, I think we might clip their wings when it comes to um, being curious, right? And so, um, what, yeah, I'm what kind of questions are you hoping that kids ask themselves after reading this? Well, first, I'm, I'm hoping they ask, why haven't I learned more about this? Um, why are people hiding this from me? Does this explain how particularly darker skinned people or black people, if they're black, arrived in the United States? So this seems quite important. Yes. <laughs> you know, then therefore I should be understanding more, you know, about this. Yes. Is there a relationship between the way Kajo was treated when he was enslaved and the way black people are treated today? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I would hope that kids uh, realize and ask the question specifically about 
because I think what, what's most, one of the most fascinating moments in the text is, is after emancipation yeah. and the uh, Kajo Lewis and others who arrived on the, what's known as the last sort of quote slave ship, uh, the Clotilda in 1859, they decide they want to go back to Africa. Like they're free, so they want to go home. And uh, they pool their money and realize they don't have enough, don't money, have enough money to go That's home. Right. Um, and I, I'm just hoping in that moment, the kid, the kid, the child asks, <laughs> so I'm oftentimes told that nobody wants to go to Africa, mm -hmm. that, that Africa is bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. But these people wanted to go home. Yeah. So tell me more about Africa. Yeah, yeah. So and not just learning about Africa in the early part of the text when you know, Kujo's a child and he's you know, coming of age, but I think that will also spark interest in learning about Africa, which is a yes. continent that our kids are also not learning about, Absolutely. just as they're not learning about slavery. Absolutely. The, um, can y'all clap for that, by the way? That was pretty amazing. Um, there are two more questions bubbling in my brain. I know we're going to get questions from the audience, but um, the, the first thing that I'm thinking about is, as you said that, was, you know, um, I think so much about like how as a kid growing up, I would often hear, you know, teachers, educators, or just folks sort of in my sphere talking about the slaves. It was always the slaves. Like there was this disconnection between my relationship and African people. Um, and so I think that to your point, to have kids asking questions about, I think Africa and its history and people is, I think is really, really brilliant. And in, in my book, uh, How the Boogeyman Became a Poet, slight plug, not even slight, it was a real plug. Um, uh, you know, I, I write, there's a, there's a story that I have in there where I remember uh, being in high school, going to go see the film Amistad. Y'all remember this? And no one really explaining to me sort of the history of all that and Sinke shouting, give us us free and not really understanding like, wait a minute, these are African women, I come from these people, like that connection, um, true power, which leads me to um, this idea of knowledge of self. So for those of you who don't know, I love hip hop and I'm always talking about the five elements and one of them is knowledge of self. The more you know about who you are, the more powerful you can show up into the world. Um, and so I'm thinking about you in this book and the knowledge of self that's included in this. What do you say to folks who are saying that this particular knowledge of self is not important and necessary in schools and libraries and therefore we're gonna ban them? What do you say? What have you been saying? Well, I, I, mean, I mean, I think first and foremost, I, I think it is in order to understand oneself, one must understand the world. <laughs> one must understand the environment that they're living in. We understand ourselves in relation, uh, you know, to others and to what's happening in the world. And in order to understand the world, we must understand history. And in order to understand modern history, you have to understand slavery. Yes. <laughs> and you know, even global history cannot be explained without explaining the transatlantic uh, trade. And, and, you, and if you talk about the transatlantic slave trade, you have to talk about colonialism. <laughs> yes. Right, and so I, I just don't know how people can understand self, yes. have knowledge of self, yes. and be ignorant about history. Yes. And I think typically the, gr the yes. more ignorant that people are about history, the more ignorant they are about themselves. Yes, yes. Uh, it's so much related, y'all. And I, uh, this is probably not another plug. I'm trying to put our books in conversation because I'm realizing something here. And can I? Just no, go ahead. No, thing. keep going. And so the reason why this is also important is because if you have the power to make people ignorant about themselves, yeah then you have the power to manipulate and control them. Yes. So then that allows us to understand why certain elected officials are literally trying yeah. to ban history yeah. so that they can better manipulate people. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, you know, the, um, the title of my book is How the Boogeyman Became a Poet, and so much of that is obviously there's a metaphor about having a fear as a young person about being authentically a black gay boy in America, and America still doesn't love black gay boys and men, um, but how much internalized racism I had soaked in as a kid because these systems and schools said, don't speak like that, don't write like that, don't do, like there was sort of this guarding 
of my posture and my being. And so realizing, you know, while I wrote my book, I was like, you know, that I went through some, I had to go through some unpacking of, wait a minute, like I've internalized this belief about myself that I'm less than according to this hierarchy of a thing. And so um, I just wanna let you know that when you, putting books like this into the world, y'all, I think, restores some of that gap and gives a lot of young people a lot of love and sense of understanding about who they are um, and realizing that, wait a minute, I am lovable, um, I am smart, I'm intelligent, I'm a part of a long history. And so I just wanna thank you for that because this, I believe, is, is absolutely anti-racist <laughs> in its approach. Um, so there's that, y'all clap for that. Um, uh, and last thing, I wanna know, Barracoon, this is one of three adaptations, I think, of Zora Neale's work, yes, that you've done? Can you walk us through just that process and then I think we'll get some more questions. Sure, so yeah, I, I am working with Zora's estate and I'm gonna adapt six books. Uh, Look at everybody's Zora's. face though, did you see? <laughs> um, in total, wow. and so this is the third wow. book. And the first book was uh, called Magnolia Flower, uh, which was based on a short story that Zora Neale Hurston wrote. Um, and the second book was called The Making of Butterflies, uh, which was based on a folk tale that, that, that Zora collected. Uh, it's a board book that is simply how butterflies came to be, uh, you know, based on a black rural folk, folk tale. And, and obviously there's, you know, there, there's this book, Barracoon. And, and, and I think it, it just goes to show that just the breadth of, of Zora Neale Hurston's sort of body of work, like a short story, a, a piece of folklore that she collected, and then a nonfiction yeah. text. Uh, and, and, and so I'm, I'm hoping through this, through these series of adaptations that, you know, like, like Alice Walker and a whole host of other writers, we're, we're really showing and demonstrating just how much of a literary legend Zora Neale Hurston yeah. truly was. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, any other thing that you might want to just say about Barracoon or this book, or like any other thing that I probably did not ask you that you want to make sure you share? Well, it's interesting when when you were, you know, talking about just identity and 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 the 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 way in which history uh, and sort of so much shapes that, and oh, I guess we were talking about that. And I, I just want to, to, to add that in many ways, I think in too many ways, when we do not teach uh, black people yeah. about enslavement and the era of slavery yeah. in all of its fullness, what that results in us not teaching black people and even black children that there was consistent and constant resistance yes. to that enslavement. Yes. And we're also not teaching uh, black people that despite the chains of slavery, the humanity of black people <laughs> never diminished. Yeah. And I'm mentioning that because during the enslavement era, even abolitionists were making this case that slavery literally embruted black people, yeah. like made them into these brutes, which is why it's so horrible, which is why it needs to end. And, and that simply was not true, yeah. right? And, and I think, and the more any group of people learn that a particular group that's facing enslavement or some sort of form of, of oppression still beats their humanity, Absolutely. it also shows the power of humanity. And, and, and you know, I think similarly, if we don't teach white children uh, slavery in all of its fullness, then we're not going to teach them that there were white people who challenged slavery. How about that? Right, and, and the irony, right, is the very people who are banning slavery, are banning it based on this supposition that we just wanna teach that all the enslavers yep. were white, yep. right? And, and all of the uh, black people were enslaved when it was much more complicated yes. you know, than that. But it makes sense, right? They don't want that child identifying with that white abolitionist 
because then that child will identify with white people who are challenging racism today. Yep, yep. Right, and, and it's all connected. But they will also see that many of the ideas and tactics and strategies that enslavers used to manipulate and yeah. control the vast majority of white people who are not enslaving people in the South and the rest of us are being used today. Yeah. yeah. And the original book banners were enslavers. Yeah, how about that? How about that? I often think so much about, ooh, I don't know many stories about white abolitionists, you know, and I think so much about like, ah, oh, that'd be a fascinating sort of, not genre of books, but like something to read. Uh, Cause I, I, I get that question, cause Tony is a white person, what can I do? And I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you about your people, but uh, please find a way to identify with white abolitionists. Um, figure out what those stories are like. So yeah, thank you for so much for that. Um, I think we got some questions from the, the big audience. All right, uh, so we're gonna, I don't know, pass the mic thing. We'll clap it up for what we got right now. Clap it up, thank you very much. Dr. Kenny, so much. I'm looking at uh, the person with the questions, by the way. This is like a weird thing. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm really, I truly love this book. And y'all be sure to pick up How the Boogeyman Became a Poet, too. Uh, let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. Um, as well. If you have questions, Chanel, she can um, pick them up for you. But I do have some. So the first one is, um, it was a young person, maybe 11 or 12, and their question is, why is the book called Barracoon? <laughs> great, great question. So the book is called Barracoon because a barracoon is where enslaved people in Africa were held. It was almost like a prison. Mm -hmm. uh, so after people were kidnapped from their homes and taken to the coast, they were essentially put in barracoons. And the reason why they needed these quote unquote barracoons was because typically those who came with ships to trade for enslaved people, it took a while for them to fill up their ships because they would typically barter they would typically try to find uh, the people who would, the enslaved people who were the cheapest, a whole host of things. And so the people who were enslaved needed to be held, typically for months at a time. And I'm mentioning this because we're often, even with those of us who are familiar with the transatlantic trade, are, we're taught that it was a long march to the coast, we're, we're taught that there was many months across the Atlantic. What we're not taught is the many months in the barracoon. Mm -hmm. I would drop the mic, but I don't, that was good. <laughs> um, somebody asked, what would your number one policy be, or priority be, if you were running for president, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi? <laughs> I chose to read that, I wanna hear. <laughs> this is gonna be good. <laughs> What would be my number one priority? Yes. Wow, I should have prepared for this since I'm in DC. <laughs> uh, exactly. My, my number one, <laughs> I think my number one priority uh, would be radically transforming our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And yeah. ensuring that everyone had access to free, high quality, yeah. Uh, healthcare, and when I say everyone, not just people in, in, in Southeast DC, but, but people who live in rural Maryland. Um, and that there were no trauma deserts. Um, that, and, and the reason why I mention this is because if you go home and look at the top 10 leading causes of death, almost every single one of them are diseases. Yes. So it's diseases, unintentional injuries, suicides. It's not homicides. <laughs> Uh, and, and people are dying. And people are dying because our system is so broken and, and people are being bankrupt by our system. Y'all got me sounding like a politician. Come on. You're doing Come a great on. job. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm like buying into it. I'm like, yeah, I want this health plan. I want, yeah, this is, yeah, I want this. Uh -huh. But I think we can all relate to that in some form or fashion, somebody in our family, something we're going, so it's, it's something that really does, I think, resonate with a lot of us. So thank you for sharing that. 
Um, given what's going on with book bans, do you have any plans to bring back your anti-racist book festival? And it says, please do, in caps. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what question would you ask Kajo today if you were interviewing him? Wow. Um, so for those of you who, who, who don't know, so I mentioned earlier how um, Kajo and other people who came and were forced to come on the Clotilda created what became known as Africa Town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Africa Town uh, still exists uh, in Mo outside of Mobile, Alabama, but it's surrounded by heavy industry, and it's now part of the Cancer Alley, uh, in in which people who live in in, in Africa Town have higher levels of uh, all sorts of cancers uh, because of all those uh, toxins that that are literally surrounding the community, and and so. You know, I would, I would ask Kajo about the decision, because they essentially, what happened is, they initially were like, we want to go back to Africa, but then when they realized the cost was so inhibitive, they were like, okay, let's just plan to save up our money and buy land here. Mm -hmm. And so I would ask him, when you look at the history of Africa Town since then, when you look at the number of your, your ancestors, or I should say your descendants, uh, who are encircled by smoke, uh, do you think y'all would have made a different decision? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe spent more time sort of saving up to eventually try to find a way back, you know, back to, to Africa. There's actually a, 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 a film on Netflix called Descendant that oh, yeah. talks about uh, Africa Town and, and the Clotilda for those who are, are interested. Awesome, thank you. The next question is, do you see your book as having any kind of connection to a movement toward reparations? So I would hope so. Um, and I, I, would, I would hope that uh, young people and older people who are reading this book will it will allow them to sit and walk in the shoes of, you know, of Kajo Lewis and, and what he faced and others faced and, and the, really the pain uh, and the loss and the dispossession that happened during the enslavement era. But I should also add that what's fascinating about this book is it doesn't end with emancipation, right? You know, Zora first goes to speak to Kajo in 1927, right? So this is what, 60 years after, 50 <laughs> or five or so years, uh, you know, after uh, emancipation. And, and so a lot happened between 1865 and, and 1927 in his life. And, and in Alabama, in Southern Alabama. And, 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 and a lot of that was governed by, by Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And so the second half of the book mm -hmm. tracks the ways in which he was also dispossessed during Jim Crow and there are actual stories of that. And so I think it actually, those who are advocating for reparations are typically not just advocating based on what was stolen from African Americans during the enslavement era, but also during the Jim Crow era. And I think you see that through, through Kojo Lewis's story. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. for sure. There's a, he develops a family, and, and well, there's a whole lot that goes on with that family, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome, thank you. What is your advice to an aspiring writer, and what's the best advice you've received about the writing process? Okay, so I just did the math. It was 62 years, right? 18, I'm sorry, it's just like- Was well, anyone was counting? There. Was, was anyone, <laughs> anyone willing to doubt? So, okay. No. Ask that question again, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> you just had to, you had to finish that one in your mind. <laughs> what is your advice to an aspiring writer and what's the best advice you've received about the writing process? So I think as it relates to my best advice to, to an aspiring writer is to 
learn and seek to hone and appreciate your own voice. So the way you express yourself on the page, you know, every great writer, you know you're reading them <laughs> by the way in which they write. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I just I would just encourage you to uh, we talked a lot about language, right? You're learning as a new writer, an aspiring writer, how you speak on the page. And and I would just encourage you to respect and protect and hone and learn your own personal language. And I would also, in, in terms of uh, the best piece of advice that, that, that I've received uh, has, has been to basically trust one's own idea, <laughs> but also realize when it's not working. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. That's a, that kind of segues into this next question, though, too. And the question is, what made you want to write? And I'm going to ask that of both of you. Wow, you could have done anything, Dr. Kendi, Dr. Tony Keith. <laughs> Why write? What, what was the thing, what was the impetus to say, you know what, I'm going to take this time, I'm going to make this space in my life to write, to jot those things down, to commemorate a lot of different experiences. Why write? So it's interesting, because I grew up um, wanting to be a sportscaster. Okay. So okay. I was a big sort of basketball fan, and I grew up watching NBA on, NB NBA on NBC in the 90s. I don't know if anybody <laughs> remembers that with Bob Costas. And, uh, and, and so I was like, hey, I would love to be a Bob Costas, right? <laughs> but then when I got to college, I told myself that I wasn't, I felt that I was a better writer than I was speaker. And, and I think that was partly because I grew up in the church. Mm -hmm. my, my, both of my parents were ministers. They always brought me around some of the greatest speakers in the world. So I was like, okay, I'm not like on these people's <laughs> level. But so I felt like I, I think I had more confidence mm -hmm. as a writer than, than as a speaker. So then I was like, okay, I'm gonna be a sports writer. Mm -hmm. And then sports writing transitioned into writing about race or wanting to be a journalist who wrote on, on, on race, but, but then ultimately I decided to go to graduate school and become you know, a scholar, and um, un unfortunately or fortunately, we, we have to write <laughs> as professors. Yeah, uh, for me, it's, uh, I've, I've been writing, you'll read about in How the Boogie Man Became a Poet, but I've been writing since I was a child, um, dealing with, again, now that I know internalized racism, internalized homophobia, I was also poor, there was a lot going on, and I would write poetry to myself at night when nobody was around, could see. By the way, in the book, again, you'll see the photocopies of those poems, which is kind of cool. But, and so my point is, I've always been writing as a way to sort of escape and deal with emotions and to kind of figure out who I am. I go to my poetry for questions a lot. If I don't know what's going on, even to this day, if I don't know what's going on in the world, I'm writing probably some kind of poem about it. But to create a book, especially one that's for young adult readers, it, what had happened was, I was at an event with one of my dear friends who's also a world famous author. We don't need to give him a shout out today. Actually, I will. Shout out to Jason Reynolds. Um, and Yay. love that guy. And, and, and um, he was doing a book signing, and I was just telling you all the story upstairs. This, this kid comes out of line to me, and he says, Where's your book? Like, you're a black gay guy, you grew up poor, but you're married now. You got to be like, how, which, you're a poet, how, What's your story? Right? And I was like, I don't. I remember saying, like, I published on the stage, not the page, or something ridiculous to this kid. Um, you know, and, and I thought to myself, like, are there stories like mine written in ways that might appeal to this young little black boy who might be gay? Or, you know, what, what do I do about this? And so I felt this, this calling, almost this need to write something, especially for young readers. And then what wound up happening, just like probably a lot of my academic work is, the more I wrote that book, the more I began to understand a lot more about myself. And so the title is How the Boogeyman Became a Poet. I wrote that book almost as an answering an essay question. How did the boogeyman become a poet? And so I wrote that thing. And I was hoping that a younger person would pick that up and be like, oh, now how to not be afraid to be yourself. Um, so that's what had to happen. That's good. That's good. Thank you both for that. Yes. So we chatted about colleges upstairs in the, in the green room. This question is, as a student of FAMU, Dr. Kendi, how would you... <laughs> How would you recount your experience on that campus? How would you recount that? We're talking about school, we're talking about academics. How would you recount that experience? So, I mean, I would say 
and what did it mean to you? Well, I think it, it was probably the first place that I felt safe. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by safe is I felt safe to express myself and learn myself. And, and, and I also felt safe to express and learn myself because at FAMU, those who are Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, of course, I gotta sound this out fully, because mm -hmm. you know, for other folk who went to HBCUs that are lesser than FAMU. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Langston University, Bowie State in the back, husband. Okay, go ahead. Um, I know you got a security team, be careful. Now. HBCUs, okay. So, you know, I, FAMU was, uh, there, it, it was, when I was there, there were people, black people from all over the nation, and even all over the world. And, and so that allowed me, there was not this sense that you had to conform mm -hmm. to a certain form of blackness. Mm -hmm. And because there weren't white folks there who were telling us like the young brother in Texas that quote, being an American mm -hmm. is, is, is conforming, you know, there wasn't, that con there wasn't that sort of demand to conform or to shape shift or to change. Mm -hmm. And that was really the first time I had experienced that. Yeah. And, and so it was, it was safe. Mm -hmm. uh, it was safe, you know, personally and culturally. And, and I think that's probably why I was able to not only grow a lot as, a, as, a, as an individual, but even grow a lot conceptually. And I actually write a lot about that in, in How to Be an Anti-Racist. And, and I, it, in a way, it, that space allowed me to, to think both good and bad things yeah. and sort of work through my thoughts uh, you know, about race, about blackness, about whiteness, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah and I'll just add, since we're doing a plug for HBCUs. <clears throat> no, but um, just to, you know, executive privilege here. Um, I attended the HBCU as well. And when I think about before I got to my HBCU, the exposure to black books that I had was nil. It was very limited. And when I got on this campus and I saw these people that looked like me and resources in a facility and library that had all this history in it that I did not have access to, I just gobbled it up. And I just started learning more and more about me. And, you know, Mahogany Books was the brainchild of my husband, but I also say it wouldn't exist if I had not had that experience at Langston University because I learned about myself. I learned about the triumphs that we had and, and also the parts that were not as beautiful. But I, if I had not known that, there would not have been this yearning to make sure everybody else had access to black books. So, but I felt at home and was exposed to things that I had never been exposed to that really focused on me, and I say me as a black person. So that, that experience, I mean, was mind blowing. So to hear you say that from your experience and how it shaped and how it really formed a lot of your ideals and who you are is powerful. So thank you for sharing that. And if I could just add very quickly that in my English 101 class, my first semester, that's when I first met Zora Neale Hurston. Wow. Ah, at yes. At FAMU. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Just absolutely. want to also say shout out to the black folks who graduated from PWIs. Thank you very much. We in the building. We in here, <laughs> right? Uh, I write in my book about a very particular black experience <laughs> that occurs at PWIs. All right, shout all right. out to black student unions and black cultural centers yes, and yes. African American yes. studies departments. Thank you. Okay, okay I just had to okay, throw okay, that out doctors, there. Okay, doctors. <laughs> black yes. terrorists, baby. Okay, <laughs> Our last question here. Um, man, okay, two. I think we have time for just two. What advice would you have for young readers who are finding their voices as authors? There's young people who are looking to do that as well. What advice for them? Well, well, first, let me just say that I really admire uh, young people who are already finding their voice as authors. I did not even begin to find my voice as an author until, you know, I was probably to you quite ancient. And, um, and so I, I, I just want to just express an admiration and, and I also want to express uh, an affection for sort of what you're doing. And, and, but I also, my biggest piece of advice 
for that young person, and I would probably say this is the case even for, for older people, is that is to really be courageous. Uh, you know, as you think of what you want to say and what you want to write, and 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 when I when I say courage, I'm, I'm not sort of speaking about courage as the sort of uh, absence of of danger, but really the strength yeah. to do what's right in the face of something that's dangerous. And I think in the case of a of a child, it can be dangerous to create and think of a story that nobody is thinking about or that nobody has written it in that way. And, and so you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Nobody's thinking of that. Nobody's created a character like that. And, and I just want to encourage you to, 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 to be courageous, right? And to find that strength to, to create that character, to create that story. Um, and because I think that the authors that I admire the most are the authors that are most courageous. Mm -hmm. um, if I may, I, I love that response. I would, I would say find a way to discover people whose voices you're in conversation with. And by that I mean, I think about, for example, a book like How the Boogeyman Became a Poet. I'm like, shout out to Elizabeth Acevedo and Mahogany Brown and uh, Jacqueline Woodson, and like so many other authors who are writing in similar kind of ways. And for young people, there are writing groups probably in your community, your neighborhood. There are poetry clubs. There are youth cope competitions. There are things, and not in all places, not in all rural places or urban places, but please know that now, I'm so excited because now, those kinds of opportunities exist. When I was a kid, they weren't around. Poetry slam teams and teachers doing things with writing was not around. So anyway, so think about whose voices yours are probably already in conversation. Write with your friends. Right with your cousins, right? Yeah. So lastly, Dr. Kendi, now that this book is out in the world two days ago, 48 hours, shout out to the book birthday of Barracoon for young readers. What, yes, let's, yes, that's out. <clears throat> it's out. What would you say when you close the last page of that manuscript that you wanted your intention to be as this book floats among all of us in the world? What do you want that intention to be? with this book? So if, if this book is for, for young people and even uh, older people in an in introductory text to, to slavery mm -hmm. and even slavery by another name as one author called it, if it's an introduction, then, then I would hope that it truly would be an introduction. It truly would be a beginning. It would, it would allow us to begin exploring some of the questions that we raised as we read that book by finding other authors and finding other books and, and, and researching for ourselves. Because I, I just do, I think because we don't understand slavery, like we just don't understand this country and we don't understand the modern world. And, and, and I, I just think that the more we understand slavery and the, more, the earlier we understand it, I think the more knowledgeable as a, as, a city, as, you know, as, a, as a community and a society will be, and the more knowledgeable we'll be, the less likely we'll be able to be manipulated uh, you know, by people. Absolutely, thank you so much, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, Dr. Tony Keith, Jr. <laughs> Bigger, 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 bigger. Uh uh. Yes, yes, thank yes. You, yes. Thank you, thank you all for being here. Yeah. Awesome. So, really quickly, as I mentioned at the beginning, for some of those who just kind of was able to, was, did miss what I said at the beginning, let me get it together. Uh, we will do photographs at the end. All of your books are already autographed. Um, and so, what we'll do is just make a line up here inside, and then we'll take the pictures outside in. Um, where you all picked up your books. Um, we really want to take a quick photo on the stage here, and then we'll go out in the hallway and have you take photos. Have your cell phones ready. I will actually take each cell phone and uh, take the photo for you. Is that okay? All right, thank you all. <laughs>